Bom dia, muito bem-vindos à última aula do curso Brasil e Palestina, fontes de identificação. Welcome to all of you, uh, to the last class of our, our course, and it's an immense pleasure, a great honor uh, to receive here uh, Selma Dabach, who is a British-Palestinian writer of fiction and a lawyer. She teaches creative writing at Goldsmiths University in London, and she's the COO of the International Center for Justice for Palestinians, the ICJP. She's also on the advisory board of the committee, uh, of the British Palestinian Committee, sorry, and her doctoral research considered whitewashing and propaganda in the novels of Muriel Spark and Soraya Antonius. Uh, after Selma speak, speaks, after her speech, uh, then we receive, and it's an immense pleasure and an honor also to receive my colleague at the university, uh, Safa Jubran. She's an associated professor at the University of Sao Paulo, where she teaches Arabic language and literature. She's an advisor for the, at the PPG, our, 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 our graduate program at university called Letra. She researches uh, in the field of translation. She's also head of a research group called Tajama, Taj uh, translation, uh, registered at uh, CNPQ. She's a literary translator, received self, several prizes for that. And uh, she's uh, the Brazilian, uh, the Portuguese translator of uh, Elias Rudi's uh, novels. Um, Baba Shams, uh, Gate of the Sun, and uh, uh, My Name is Adam, the first volume, which is already out. So, Safa, it's a great pleasure to receive you. Uh, and finally, it's an immense, immense uh, pleasure and honor uh, to receive uh, our special guest for this course, Elias Khoury. He's a renowned novelist who has dedicated his most, most recent uh, works to the topic of Palestine, including Gate of the Sun, Children of the Ghetto. He has acted as editor of different Arabic journals, uh, arts festival director, professor at Columbia, uh, New York. Uh, he's a public intellectual who plays a major role in the Arabic cultural scene and in the defense of liberty of expression. Professor Safa will have a lot more to say about uh, Elias Houdi uh, and, and uh, her work in, in, in translating also his uh, novels. So. Thank, thank you to all of you, and thank you to all our students who have continued up to now, up to today with this uh, course. So it's great to have you. Selma, please feel free to, to begin. The floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm really grateful to Professor, Professor Klemscher for this um, wonderful invitation and to the University of Sao Paulo to invite me here to speak on this topic today. I've been asked to address the topic of is there a current Palestinian narrative, which is a fairly daunting one, as surely there is, are as many Palestinian narratives as there are Palestinians. And, and it's, it's also, furthermore, it's a little daunting to be speaking on this subject in, in, in the company of someone um, as um, esteemable as Elias Khoury, whose work I have read and admired for many years. Um, so what I'm going to be doing in the time allocated to me is not to pretend that I can cover off on this topic in a comprehensive way, but to say, to present some findings from my own research and to suggest some ideas for discussion and future lines of inquiry. So if we could possibly have the first of my slides. Okay, so that's my the organization I work for in London. If I could have the next slide, please. And um, these are just some images I put together. And then one following. Okay, so I started off, for those of you who've read my abstract, with this um, poem by um, Abu Ala al Ma'ari, which, um, if you, I'll give you a chance to read it, it says, Hold tight to what is most yourself, don't squander it, don't let your life be governed by what disturbs you. Um, there are different interpretations as to what Al Ma'ari is referring to here, but to me, it's a kind of relevant reminder that we should always be not just defining ourselves as individual people according to what we want, aspire to, and the values that we hold dear to ourselves, but not just to be responding to the pressures against us. So, it, in the Palestinian context, to me, what I'm saying here is that we need to not just um, as resistance movements, we have not just to be defensive 
in terms of um, events on the ground, but also to develop a strategy, a long-term strategy with positions of, uh, of desirable outcomes uh, in sight. So if I could just have the next slide, please. I have quite a few slides. The first ones I will be spending a little bit more time over on, and then I'll be going much more quickly. So to start off with here, we've got uh, what is a narrative, basically, is a starting point. And there's a really good article that I refer all of you to on the issue of what is a, the, the need for political dimensions within a Palestinian narrative by Hazen Jumjun. And he says, OK, so a, a national narrative is who are we? Where, where did we come from? Where are we going and why? OK, and in terms of... Uh, when it comes to Palestine, I see there has been, th for the purposes of this talk, three main thrusts of narrative when it comes to Palestine, the political, the legal, and the literary and artistic. I'll be speaking mainly on the literary and artistic, but to, cut, but to consider first the political and legal, which are broad, very broad topics within themselves. But they, they are, they are easier, I would argue, to analyze and to identify than the literary is, because they normally take more of a declaratory form. These are statements. They are statements saying, this is where we are, this is what we should be. They normally come from prescribed organizations or channels, and there is normally a sort of a ranking in terms of a priority as to what should be listened to. So, Whereas the, the literary narrative, when it's developed, is far more nuanced, it's more private, it serves more as a confessional. It's not exterior projections, but interior responses. Its messaging, if it exists at all, is coded, individualized, and emotive. Now, the political and the international legal, when it comes to Palestine, are far from being aligned. Um, and it's safe to say that historically, the political was often very, when, when there was a Palestinian liberation organization leadership, which you will have discussed in earlier classes on this excellent course. But when there was a PLO, you often had a, a rejection um, of the United Nations or the international legal line when it came to Palestine, because it was seen to be um, a compromise of the desire, desired position. In recent years, to an extent, this there's been a bit of a reversal. The legal is sometimes holding a stronger position of desired outcome than the Palestinian Authority stated um, requests. So that, but also the 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 legal, um, the international legal is now being developed more notably in line through a dedicated uh, series of special rapporteurs of the occupied Palestinian territories in a way that is more sensitive to Palestinian aspirations. And the civil society movement is increasingly being centered around the boycott and divestment and sanctions movement, which is gaining considerable global support, both again, supporting the legal for political outcomes. So, in terms of um, what a Palestinian narrative is, one point that I need to make from the outset, given the nature of the Palestinian population uh, being dispersed across many um, boundaries, is that, is that it's essentially international, transnational, and no matter what emphasis is placed on the land of the former mandate of Palestine, any identification of the Palestinian narrative has to take on a transboundary anti-boundary, beyond boundaries, boundaryless approach. It is a distinguishing feature, and I would say that it's a power um, within it. Secondly, the question of who we are and where we came from is a sensibly easier question to answer to the ones about where we're going. There are, there are approximately 10 million people globally who self-identify as being Palestinian, two thirds of whom live in diaspora and forced exile most of whom insist on native belonging to Palestine. There are multiple examples defining who Palestinians are and where they came from, from the UNRWA definition of a refugee to this one from the Palestinian National Covenant of 1968, where in its Article 4 it says, the Palestinian personality is an innate, 
persistent characteristic that does not disappear and is transferred from fathers to sons. The Zionist occupation and the dispersal of the Palestinian Arab people as a result of the disasters which came over it do not deprive it of its Palestinian personality and affiliation and do not nullify them. The assumption is here is that there's something, there's a sort of immutable quality to being Palestinian that does not change. This idea is increasingly being challenged um, by the wide range and diversity of voices of Palestinian writing in other languages. The heterogeneity and diversity of experience is one aspect um, that is clearly found in Palestinian literature. Of the three narratives, literature is the most clearly able to reflect and to expand on differences rather than to categorize essentials as to who are Palestinians. And, and there's one work by Maurice Ebelini, um, um, which looks at diaspora literature from Palestinians in Iceland to Australia, to the US and the UK. Um, and, and he shows, as one reviewer said, that being Palestinian is about much more than being in, just, in, just being in Palestine. So the last part of the Jamjoun quote about where we are going and why, what Palestinians are seeking amounts to a decolonization practice that, in Nora Erekart's words, reorganizes the relevant relational terms mediating Israelis as settler sovereigns and Palestinians as natives marked for erasure. The solution sought has also been answered with assertions of the right of return and a peaceable future. So this is the end that we're looking for. Now, what state that, what form that takes is, is you know, obviously it's a subject of huge debate if it's two state or one state or multi-state or federal. I and mean, it's not the topic of this, this talk. But there are also statements within earlier uh, pronouncements by Palestinian leadership about what is being, what, what we're after. And there's this talk about an atmosphere of tranquility and peace for the Holy Land. And then you've also got um, DFLP documents from the 70s, which talk about international solidarity in the struggle against the common enemy of imperialism, Zionism and Nazism throughout the world and for the progress liberty and peace of all peoples. So the two things from, from the original sort of Palestinian documents on the political struggle um, will refer to, which are no longer really referred to much anymore. One is armed um, Arab unity and the other is armed struggle. And these were central to the political argument. But there's now been a sort of movement away from that. Um, and international law is increasingly uh, being used as a bar um, being fought for by Palestinian advocates. So, and as Professor Noor Masalha has commented on recently, Israel has never complied with any of the 200 or so UN uh, reg regulations or resolutions on the situation in Palestine, Israel. So, um, and then you can, and it's also known that Israeli government lobbies overtly and behind the scenes apply pressure to water down or dismantle UN commissions, uh, such as the new um, independent UN Commission of Inquiry, the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, the UN Human Rights Council and the laws of universal jurisdiction. So the, Palestini the Palestinians campaign on the other, on the other side to, to strengthen these, these international legal um, uh, bodies and um, and to have their support um, and it so the Palestinian narrative has international law as a backbone and it has been become a sort of test as to whether international law is being applied free of political influence as to whether it is being applied with regards to the Palestinians rather than more politically expedient choices so the Palestinians have thus become the upholders of international law, but it is, as uh, Dr. Mazen Mastry of City University put it, international law plus that we are after. We are after a legal regime that is goes beyond what is being asked for in the international legal documents. It's a starting point. It's a framework that we uphold. And as such, we aspire to social justice and to anti-settler anti colonial, anti um, 
as we do with anti-settler colonial anti-apartheid movements globally. Okay, so that's just on the background. If I could have the next slide. So this this slide, what I'm showing here is, um, I'm sure, I hope you're able to, to read some of the text there. So again, it's a slightly longer quote from this Jamjoun um, reclaiming the political dimension of the Palestinian narrative. And what he's saying here is uh, wherever foreign, I'll just read it in case you can't read it, whether foreign domination has been involved, wherever foreign domination has been involved, anti-colonial nationalist currents have invariably come to the fore, often bearing a narrative that imagines an idyllic, pre-colonial and anachronistically national past so there's this visualization of the past that exists. This past, the narrative tells us, was severed by the brutality of the colonizer and can only be defeated by a heroic anti-colonial struggle that brings about liberation. Such liberation is most often imagined in the form of an independent, sovereign, and invariably national state, okay? So that is that is like the, the standard model. I'm not necessarily saying that that is outdated, but that is the traditional model. So maybe this slide should be titled um, traditional narratives. The next, um, the next quote that I have is with regards to an expectation of a narrative when it comes to the Palestinians. And it's a quote from um, an anthropological book by um, um, Ali Klebo, uh, before the mountains disappear, which is saying that, which where he's talking about going to Gaza with some playwrights, this is during the first intifada, and they are interviewing Palestinians for the purpose of developing a play. And what he notices with them is the absence of inquiry into other aspects of these individuals' lives. And he says, these these two playwrights that he's with and it's in no way a criticism of him he talks about the catharsis of working with them and the, the positivity of their of their dedication to the cause but he says they're interested in the palestinian experience from a solely narrative perspective they have clear objectives they're interested in the palestinian as a political victim so it's a very limiting um depiction of, of who a palestinian is then the last, the last um, line of quote is from Etel Adnan, who's saying that narration, as she sees it, is an outdated form. So she's, this is more of a kind of stylistic pronouncement. And this is reflective of, of kind of where, we're, where, the, where the modern sort of Anglo-Saxon novel has been going since the Second World War. So there's been a movement away from having a kind of a traditional form of storytelling to having more, um, uh, to it being more of a subject of experimentation. And this has made it very difficult, I would argue, for, um, for writers who have a political issue that they wish to put across, uh, maybe not so bluntly as in, as in a message, but in a, in a way that carries and mobilizes and explains the cause to, to um, uh, to write in a way that is evaluated with the right uh, tools of critique. So if we could just move to, to slide five, that'd be great. Okay, so just in terms of what we're up against and how I see um, the current situation, I think I'm, the work of Ishil Mbembe, the Cameroonian philosopher, is something that really resonated with me. And at the conference where I first met Professor Kemsher, one of the speakers there from South Africa was saying that maybe this term apartheid that we're kind of clinging on to, that we're, we're, we're now, you know, not clinging on to, but we're now really lobbying and behind since the, um, since the human rights um, organizations um, of Amnesty International Human Rights Watch, Al Haq and Batsalem have all declared there to be an apartheid state. This is a word that we're very keen to inject into the Palestinian narrative and narratives around Palestine to reframe um, and to make clear the power imbalance. And I stand by that. But what this person from South Africa was saying is maybe this term is not enough because what is being experienced under occupation is far harsher. As Desmond Tutu once said, it's almost, almost made apartheid South Africa seem like a bit of a picnic compared to what the 
Palestinians are living under. And so these these other sort of add-ons that I was playing around with, one is techno and the other is necro-apartheid. When, when using the, the part, I mean, techno is self-explanatory, but necropolitics, um, which is the use of social and political power to di dictate how some people may live and how some must die. So it's the creation of a sort of death worlds or new unique forms of existence that confer upon them the status almost of the living dead. So um, as Ishil Mbembe says, in the context of pa Palestine, colonial occupation not only amounts to, can you switch the slide, please? And it's like control and surveillance, but also, and then the next slide, these ones are quite quick, separation, and then on to the next slide. But it's also synonymous with isolation, okay? So it's a splintering occupation which keeps with the splintering urbanism characteristic of late modernity, of, of suburban enclaves and gated communities. Okay, so this is this is where we've we, we're at now. So then can we go to the next slide, please? Which is again um drawing this is um something that seems to have been lost in that slide, but anyway. Um, it's the extraction and looting of um, natural resources. And so as political, um, as political categories, populations are then disaggregated, this is what Mbembe says, into rebels. And then could you go to the next slide? These are the categories of people, child soldiers, victims. The next one. Refugees. And the next one. And the incapacitated. Um, so these were his categories that he felt. And this one, it says, um, these people who are incapacitated through mutilation or simply massacred on the model of ancient sacrifices, while after enduring horrific exodus, exodus, the survivors get confined in camps and zones of exception. So what Mbembe was doing, and he does refer specifically to Palestine, but he's been drawing global patterns of treatment of uh, of, of the non-person, the person who is at the other, at the receiving end of this, of necropolitics as he describes it. Please switch slide, please. So you end up with this, and I know that um, Samar Abdel-Nur has written on this, these areas where Palestinians are being used as, as um, there's this horrible um, phenomena of, of like a sort of lab-like um, vocabulary, laboratory-like vocabulary, which is used around uh, the Gaza Strip. And in terms, and in the recent um, bombardments a couple of weeks ago, there were, again, accounts of new new bombs seeming and art, um, weaponry being tried. So the, and together, the, the cumulative imagery that starts to come out of Palestine is one of which, of somewhere which has been trashed as, as a brutalized image um, a prevention of beauty, of, of um, harmony, of, of cultural development that has been a systematic result of de-development. Could we then move on to the next image? So in terms of the way that images are manipulated, and this is something that just, it's, it's such a huge topic, but it's something that I consider to be really important when you're thinking about um, Palestinian cause, the depiction of the Arab world, the self-depiction of the Arab world, and the kind of narratives that are being built. But it fascinates me how in the middle of the 20th century, you had two things happening almost coterminously. One was you had the introduction of the figurative image into the Arab world, which was due to, um, which Abdel Fattah Clito um, talks about in his book, The Clash of Images, where you've had um, a lack of physical depictions of people for, for religious reasons and a lack of the moving image, again, due to technological reasons. Um, until the 1950s with Western influences, this starts to change. That also coincides with the uh, growth of Hollywood and the influence of Israel on Hollywood is something that anyone in the Arab world is, is, is or who's sensitive to Palestinians or observer of cinema has been aware of for a very long time. But this recent book on Hollywood and Israel, which came out 
from Columbia University Press explains just quite how deep, how systematic, how structured, how well funded and how well organized the, um, the interplay was uh, between um, pro-Israeli uh, groups in Hollywood and, um, uh, and filmmakers. Uh, so you've got the two things happening at the same time, from having a lack of images, what there is suddenly a glut of moving images, well-funded with high production values, which generally show the, not just the Palestinians, but the Arab people as a whole, in a very negative light, um, usual um, uh, stereotypes being as, as terrorists, etc. So we're now, as... as um, storytellers as, as people developing narratives uh, from the Arab world. We're trying to counter this influx of, of negative um, depictions um, and consistently negative representations. And the coincidence, um, the, the way that some of these big studios were instrumental in, um, in, in the Nakba of 1948, in filming uh, in, in obfuscating the true picture of the ethnic cleansing that took place is something that is currently being exposed in, in film. Um, and it's something that um, needs further research and inquiry. Could I have the next slide, please? So then we're going back to the sort of al Maori idea that what are, we, what are we for, but also what are we against? So we can say, okay, all these things are against us. These are the negative depictions that have been made about us. But what Abu Luhud, Ibrahim Abu Luhud says is, okay, so to solely view Palestinians in contradistinction to British and Zionist representations of the Palestinian is also not positive, okay? Because we're just, we're just working against, it's a defensive position. So can I have the next slide? But there are many challenges. There are many challenges for anybody writing on Palestine or making a film about Palestine, which is that we have been subjected to a systematic process of erasure. So it's not just the villages around 500 or so villages which have been erased. You've also got, um, which are documented in um, Walid Khaldi's book, which I show there, you've got the, um, the libraries. There's a Jazeera documentary called The Great Book uh, Robbery about the libraries being, uh, Palestinian um, libraries being taken. Um, you've got land registry documents which has disappeared and then the Palestinian film archives and I've got a picture there of my, my friend the Palestinian filmmaker Hazal Hassan who made a film about the disappearance of the film archives in Beirut in 1982. At the time she made that film she was still looking to try and find out and that that's a shot of her trying to look for some for the films in a graveyard in Beirut but since then she has um, the, the, these uh, films turned up in the Israeli military archives. So there has, been, there has been theft on a grand scale and erasure. So we have very few images and the ones in the Palestinian film archive were of the resistance movement. We have very few uh, images of that. We also have very few of the expulsion of 48 and other things. So, the responsibility is therefore to try and rebuild, to reimagine. So could I have the next slide, please? Um, and one of the challenges which I looked at with my PhD was with regards to the interior. You see, these interior spaces, particularly female spaces, are particularly female in their nature. They're per personal, private, female, domestic. They're intense. They're the place of love, longing, and desire being expressed, okay? Um, so these places were, if I could have the next slide, We've got many obstacles to being able to visualize, particularly early 20th century interior Palestinian spaces for, for a number of reasons. One is that many of the villages uh, were destroyed. Two, there's a lack of images. So there wasn't much of a painting tradition and the, the European um, tradition of sort of water paintings, etc., seems to have died out by the end of the 19th century. So early 20th century, there weren't that many people doing watercolor. Some of the watercolors that exist of um, the interior of Palestinian homes come from the end of the 19th century. Um, then um, uh, photography 
uh, flash photography wasn't developed enough to take pictures of inside of homes as well. It was also because it seemed to be a female domain, a lot of visitors would not be able to go inside these houses to, to document lives uh, there. There's um, a gender and a class bias of, often when it comes to Palestinian uh, women villages. And, and also in, in terms of the Palestinian storytelling about what life was like. Um, something Salim Tamari talks about is there's sometimes a sense of bravado or shame and in terms of how these stories are recounted. Can I have the next slide, please? So how do we decolonize a narrative? You know, how do we rebuild a narrative? And um, a writer from Hawaii, has put, um, Leuni, has put these four points. One is rediscovery and recovery. Second one, mourning. Third one, dreaming. And the fourth, commitment. So could we go on to the...